George is a unique community. We have all kinds of industries, trades, and working people. Welcome to our CKPG News special. We're about to meet a handful of those hardworking people that call our community home. Well, it's no secret that Prince George residents love their green spaces, but we also love to throw some color at them too. There are about 60 parks in town, and we're about to meet a two-person crew that make our city beautiful every single day. And I start from those chives and work our way back towards the corner over there where we finished edging and just That's get this good. weeded. And now I have to grab my trowel. <laughs> Sounds good. That's Brenda Toraville and Justin Hunter. It's 9 o'clock in the morning on a typical Wednesday, and they've been at it since the start of their day, 7 a.m. This is the garden along 15th Avenue heading into the downtown. We caught up with the crew that tends that garden and others over the summer. How do you decide what garden you're going to be taking care of? We go from garden to garden. So once I've completed the main job sites, then I will come into this garden. And because it's getting a bit on the weedier side, that's why we're here today. So we're, we're thinning it out to get the vegetables growing properly and making sure that we don't have a lot of insect problems. And How many gardens do you, do you take care of? I do CN Aquatic, the cemetery, 3rd and 5th, 20th Avenue, 1st and George, 17th and Victoria. Um, rumor has it I'm getting the new one. <laughs> and, oh, and the Elder Center. Get all these marigolds deadheaded. On a typical day, this is a big garden. This is a huge garden. How long does it take you to get this to look like this? It'll take about a week. Really? That, it, that, I thought it would take a little longer than that. No, it'll take about a week and it'll also take about a week to come through it and weed it back out again to we'll finish edging and then we'll bring the weed whacker in and get it done, completed. Then we're going to go up and work on that top bed a bit. Okay. Closer inspection reveals an eclectic collection of plants. There are ornamental cabbages, marigolds, zucchini, roses. So this whole process gets started like you'll be planning next year's garden this fall? Yeah, starting September I'll be making my decisions and then the majority of the vegetable plants in here are started from seed. So in April I will have started those seeds in the greenhouse and some of the flowers we order in, um, the marigolds, they will be started from seed as well. And how do you decide what you're going to plant? Like when do you plot it out in your head? Do you have a vision in your head of how it's all going to look? Absolutely, and I usually have, like there's typical plants I like to have in here. So I like having squashes and pumpkin plants. The pumpkin plants have the big bright yellow bloom on them. So when you're coming down the hillside, you see that. Yeah, and, and what do you do with the fruit? You've got zucchinis and lots of them coming up here by the looks of things. Um, so in short order, you're gonna have to figure out what to do with them. What do you do with them? We will harvest those and they'll go over to St. Vincent's uh, we take some, sometimes we take it up to the Salvation Army and over to the Elder Center, and then sometimes I eat it. <laughs> Do people come and pick over here sometimes? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Is that okay? Are you okay with yeah. that? Yeah. 11,000 vehicles cruise this strip of road every day. So next time you're driving or walking around, take time to admire the various gardens in the city because in the words of Thomas Jefferson, no occupation is so delightful to me as the culture of the earth and no culture comparable to that of the garden. No matter what community you visit, the people living there rely on public transit. And here in Prince George, the amount of work the drivers do to make sure their passengers arrive safe and sound might surprise you. My name is Laura. I've been a transit driver for 16 years. Each day, Laura's responsible for transporting hundreds or even thousands of passengers from point A to point B. But before that, she's got to make sure the bus is safe. My windshield wiper, just so it doesn't fall down on anybody. All the bells to make sure they're working properly. All the hand straps are secure. Okay, here we are. Once that's done, it's time to hit the road. 
Each day is different for Laura, from the route she drives to the people she sees, and the people she says is the best part. You get a lot of people from different walks of life. And I like to treat them the same. It makes the job a, a lot easier. And anything to make the job easier is worth it. Despite what it might seem like, being a transit driver is much more than just getting behind the wheel of a bus. Multitasking. People don't realize how much multitasking we have to do while driving. And we have to be aware, constantly scanning, watching our people, talking on the radio. So people don't really realize how demanding it is. Laura says she continues to learn every day, even after 16 years. But a lot can change in that time, and the biggest in her eyes is ridership. We've really gotten so busy that the buses are full all day long. So a, a major increase in ridership. At the end of the day, though, it's a rewarding, if sometimes forgotten, job. Very rewarding. I love it. Well, sitting down with a cold glass of beer is easy, but the process behind it, not so much. There's been a number of craft breweries that have popped up in our community over the last little while, and you may be wondering how that cold glass of beer got in front of you. A typical brew day would be, um, we roll in around 7.30. Uh, we would first monitor uh, our fermentation. Paul Gonsalves has been brewing beer for six years and came to Trench Brewing in 2017 to pursue his passion. However, he didn't always know that beer was his calling. He was a baker for 10 years and his love for beer was kickstarted in Portland. My sister, who went to school in the States, had just recently moved to Portland. And this was like early 2000s and there was a really big craft beer scene there and I'd visited a few times and my brother-in-law was like really really into craft beer and he took me around to like a lot of really cool breweries and I just kind of fell in love with it there. He loved it so much he began brewing his own beer at home and did it for three years before getting a job in industry. When it came time to make a little bit of a career change I got sick of waking up really early mornings through the bread. I, uh, I got a job at House Sound Brewing in Squamish BC. Gonsalves, a brew day starts at 7.30 and making a batch of beer will take him straight to the end of his day. A lot of work is involved in brewing the perfect batch of beer, starting with pre-milling malt, turning it into a mash-like mixture before bringing the brew to a bubbly boil. Once that boil's finished, we transfer it from the boil kettle into the whirlpool. And all the whirlpool does, it's a giant flat bottom vessel and we spin the entirety of the wort to drive any coagulated proteins and any residual ingredients like hops or orange peel or whatever into a giant pile in the middle and it just helps clarify it. Then the liquid is cooled and transferred to fermentation vessels. Depending on the style and the yeast strain we'd be using, uh, fermentation can take anywhere from seven to eight days to 14 days. And after the wait, it's time to add carbonation to the beer and then wait some more, allowing it to mature, which can take anywhere from 10 days to nine months, depending on the style of beer. For Gonsalves, this is a labor of love and he's grateful for the freedom that comes with it. Every time you, you, you read, pick up a, a brewing magazine, there's always like new styles emerging, new, new techniques coming out. So I love just like the constant challenge of like trying to like research those or develop them myself and implement them in the brewery. So the next time you sit down to enjoy a glass of beer, you might be able to savor it that much more knowing just how it got there. There you go. Nice cup. And coming up next on our CKPG News special, we're not all so lucky to know what career we were born to do, but that's exactly what happened to Shannon Wright. Some people are lucky enough to know what they were born to do. Shannon Wright has always been a part of the beauty industry, but she opened her own salon in Prince George 13 years ago. But the Pepper Tree Hair Studio has become more than just a place to get your hair done. Make sure my hair is really good today. <laughs> Connecting with clients is one of Shannon Wright's favorite parts of her job. I love meeting people, hearing their stories, 
I love creating and just making people feel better about themselves and helping them, helping them to be how they want to see themselves. Wright grew up in Houston, BC and is from Hazleton. She spent her childhood in her mom's hair studio, which is where her love of beauty began. As a little girl, I would go to her salon and I would do my homework and fold towels. After elementary school, then in high school, she put me to work with her as her assistant. And I've just always really loved it. Wright worked at Pepper Tree Hair Studio for three years before buying the business in 2006, where she continues to work with her mom. She gets to do what she loves and can even find a balance owning her business while being a mother herself. But Pepper Tree Hair Studio is more than just a place to get your hair done. Wright also sells Indigenous artwork and products and shares her culture with her clients. I am a Gitsan Hereditary Chief and when we decided to bring this in it was more to showcase our culture and I, we thought we had a really good platform um, to showcase our culture. This painting represents and shares stories of her hometown, Hazleton. Totem Park had all of the totem poles standing and over the years they've all fallen and so now there's one left standing and that's our totem pole and there's a ballpark around it now. Sharing her culture with people who might not know much about it is highly rewarding for Wright. For me growing up, this really wasn't quite the norm. Um, so we're starting to see a, a shift within not just the community, but also nationally, where we're able to celebrate our culture and celebrate on a national level of who we are as Indigenous people. Every day for Wright at Pepper Tree Hair Studio is unique, each day being shaped by her passion and sharing what's meaningful to her with others. And much like Wright, Leslie Matthews has always known she wanted to be a hairdresser. But her story is just a little different. It started when she was a kid and she was asked to give the family dog a haircut. Well, all of her tips and tricks she's learned over the years have been self-taught. And today she continues to run a pet parlor and groom dogs of all sizes. Um, here we have uh, two pairs of thinners. These are what we call chunkers and these are what we call thinning shears. You can tell that they're just a little bit wider this pair is than this pair. Many people may not have an idea what these tools are used for. These instruments are used to give back to those creatures who have a history of loyalty and companionship with humans. They're morning makers. That's what I like to call them. They can make your morning badly or good depending on if you found that poop in the kitchen floor or not. But for the most part, they usually put a smile on your face when you wake up in the morning. As a teenager, Leslie Matthews' fury for grooming dogs began with the family dog. Fast forward 27 years, she continues to bathe. I just gotta make sure she's a little free of mats. Groom and blow dry dogs. All in an effort to find the perfect cut that suits the breed and a cut that pleases the owner. We go through what we can and can't do for their dog, um, what we think might look good, and they can tell us what they think looks good, and we come together on what we think, and usually I come out making the dog look pretty cute. <laughs> when Matthews first began to get serious about grooming, most of the scissors were made for right-handed people forcing her to adapt into a right-handed, dominated trade. I'm left-handed, and 27 years ago, when we first started grooming, um, we didn't have the luxury of the internet and finding left-handed this or that. So I actually learned right-handed scissors, right-handed scissors in, in the left-handed, in my left hand, and uh, I became a really great with a pair of scissors, with a pair of straight shears. Um, Right-handed people had the luxury of using curved scissors, using thinning shears. I had to more so make it happen with a pair of scissors. Stand up, buddy. For Matthews, grooming is more than using the correct tool properly. For her, developing a sense of calm between groomer and animal makes the job easier. It's pressure. I like to call the, you know, it's kind of like the same pressure as you feel when you're about to go to the doctor and you kind of think, what's he going to tell me? And so I kind of think the dogs kind of feel that kind of pressure. And then we just have to be confident for them and calm so they can feed off of our confidence to do a good job at the end of the day. 
And coming up next, it may not be his job, but he treats it like one as he heads to the gym five days a week. Fitness can feel like a full-time job for some, and for Barry Colbank, it's no different. He heads to the gym five days a week, and he boards the bus with his red and white support cane in his hand. The visually impaired weightlifter goes to the gym to support not only his physical health, but his mental health as well. Everyone faces obstacles in their fitness journey, but few persevere the way Barry Colbank does. The 46-year-old Prince George man has been visually impaired for nearly 30 years, and it clearly hasn't stopped his drive at the gym. Colbank was diagnosed with a genetic disease at 15 that rendered both him and his brother visually impaired. After trying to find ways to adjust to his new life situation, Colbank returned to the gym, a place he frequented growing up. He's been at the YMCA of Northern BC ever since. Eight or nine years ago, I kind of came back and was wondering if I was going to be able to do it again because I hadn't done it in a long time. But the Y was really great about helping me to, uh, you know, to come here and to be able to, you know, train because I also like when I first started coming here, I had somebody that helped me kind of get around and all of that stuff. And then I also and then they would guide me through and kind of taught me where all the different pieces of equipment are. <laughs> One thing that isn't pertinent to Colbank's experience in the gym are the mirrors. While so many of us are motivated by the change in our own reflections, Colbank has had to find other motivators. Mostly, he knows how important his workouts are to supporting his mental health on top of his physical. Just it helps me physically and I love, you know, the pump and working out and pushing myself to see what I can do and, you know, and to, you know, test my limits and on different things like that. Like I love that part of it, but also just the mental aspect of it, like how the natural endorphins and just how good it makes me feel. So I have had some challenges and struggles, like being visually impaired, you know, you, you know, struggle with some different things mentally maybe. And, uh, and this really helped me a lot to get out of that and to uh, continue pushing forward. His situation is one he's fully embraced and is able to have fun with as well. Barry usually works out with his friend Gary, who also is visually impaired. Together, they fold YMCA towels and call themselves the blindfolders. Their situation makes for some unique experiences in the weight room. I was going over to the lap pull down machine and I went to feel to get on it. And I guess the per there was a person on it, but this person had headphones in, so he didn't hear me coming. And this guy wasn't sure what I was going to do. And I literally put my hand on that person's lap or whatever too. And I was just like, oh, and so I quickly held up the cane and then they understood that, uh, that I was visually impaired. and I wasn't just some weird guy groping around the gym. So I have had different things like that happen for sure, right? Colbank credits his frankly pretty insane physique to his genetics and the extensive nutrition studies he did while receiving his university degree in dietetics. He should also factor in the commitment and tenacity that it takes to get himself in the gym five times a week and how hard he works while he's there. It's all part of the message Colbank preaches. Don't let barriers stop you and try to do it anyways and figure out a way. Sometimes you might not be able to do something the way that somebody else can do it, but it doesn't mean that you can't do it. And you can, might have to do it a little bit differently, but at least you can be out there and try to do different things. And, and it does create anxiety and it's, it can be a challenge and a struggle to start out with, but I mean, you can work through it and people will help you. And coming up next on our CKPG News special, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. For Rod Gray, his art is his livelihood. Art is subjective. What's loved by some might not be loved by all, but that doesn't bother Rod Gray, who is a master of a unique medium, and he has been perfecting his craft for more than 20 years. Living in Prince George, you probably know someone whose home looks something like this. Yeah, it's a little cluttered, but like a museum, kind of, sort of. It's a fantastic classroom for that reason. Well, maybe not exactly like this. This is Rod Gray's classroom, where he teaches gun education and conservation. It's an opportunity to promote his main business, his Monday to Friday, Bare Bones Taxidermy, a craft he's been working on for most of his life. In my early 20s, I believe it was, I was asked to go guiding, big game hunting guiding, because I was a hunter by nature anyways, and that's what I used to do, so they recognized it. 
and asked me to come along. Well, with that job, you have to learn how to process animals. If you think about harvesting an animal and utilizing it from start to finish, that's what my attraction was besides just going and meeting new people and from all over the world. But you have to learn how to process, which means skinning. That is the first thing in doing good taxidermy. So you have to go through a process. And that's always skinning, salting, drying. And then it has to go through a tanning process. So after the tanning process, it'll come back looking like that tent. There's always multiple projects to do throughout the day. There's never a day where you're wondering what you're going to do or if you're going to be bored. No, there's four or five things going on because there's always drying time. So the first thing is going on a town run, perhaps getting some supplies, getting back here and just getting at her. And so all the stuff that uh, has to dry first is always the priority. Scalpel comes in very handy for a lot of my work. I've actually skinned whole moose with just a scalpel. Pretty necessary kind of a tool for me. Get nice and fine intricate work around places like this eyeball here and then you leave a, a rim of skin around the edge. Because when I put the eyeballs, when I put those glass eyeballs in the mannequin with some clay around the edges to define eyebrows and stuff like that, this skin gets tucked into the clay around the edges of the eye and helps hold it into place while it dries. So this is where you, this is the point where you kind of hurry up and wait. You don't want to rush through this because you can cut a hole in it real easy. And if you do, that's on short hair. So short hair cuts are hard to disguise. You really need to be available to people in this kind of a work, especially during hunting seasons. And then you might pull some late nighters there, but so you really got to have a little bit of an artistic ability or interest in what you're doing as well to try and make this animal look like it's still alive. I was always interested in art. I took five different art classes throughout high school and seemed to be half decent at this trade. Every little movement of the eye creates an expression. I guess it's like 80% of everything we do anyway is visual starts with the eyes and you can do a lot of different things to <laughs> communicate with your eyes right so yeah you can make them look pleasant surprised happy angry want to eat you whatever the customer wants eh? i think the best reaction was when i went into sally's i got a membership at sally's sally's is a very interesting little shop yeah. but for taxidermy i found i went in there one time just for some whitener i don't know what it was and man you look around in there Lots of taxidermy stuff. I even got fake eyelashes for a deer one time, and they don't understand. When I'm in there shopping and asking questions, those girls are like, okay. Not everyone will understand the art, but this classroom full of finished projects serves as a conversation piece for students and a showcase for future customers. And I can totally promote ethical hunting and behavior from the very start. I like that. Thanks for joining us for our CKPG News Special. As you relax on this last long weekend of summer, remember, it's a labor of love for many of the people that work in our community.